Good day, everybody. My name is Tezeba Lohi. I'm the communications officer for Southwest. Welcome and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. I'm just going to give you a few house rules to ensure that we have a smooth running of today's webinar. The first house rule would be to note that all opinions and statements are those of the individual making the presentation and not necessarily the opinion or view of Southwest. This webinar will be recorded and will be available on the Southwest website within seven days. For the best viewing of the presentation material, please click on maximize in the upper right corner of the slide window, and then you can click restore to return to normal view. Please turn off other applications that require internet connection to avoid slow transmission and blurry vision. Audio is transmitted over the computer, so please have your speakers or headphones on and volume turned up in order to hear. We do not have a telephone connection. Questions should be submitted to the presenter during the presentation using the question section at the right side of the screen. You can click on the drop down arrow, type your question, and then submit. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Please note that when you're typing your questions, refrain from using acronyms to allow the moderator to easily read your questions out. With that being said, I would hand over to Ingrid to introduce today's guest speaker. Ingrid, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Northern Branch uh, would like to welcome you all to this presentation on uh, aquaponics. Um, we say thank you very much to Leslie Termorshaisen, who has agreed to do the presentation for, for us after many uh, years of trying to get him to do something like that at the Northern Branch. Um, we have had a short CV up uh, on the invitation, but I thought I'll just say a few more interesting things about Leslie. Um, as the production manager at QCOI in the early 2000s, he established a satellite grower program for rearing of koi. He optimized the operation of two hatcheries and 13 grow out sites in five provinces and was involved in various aspects of and in the breeding of 20 different, different varieties of koi. At Unagi International, he designed and executed a research plan to support the development of an eel farming industry. This is in Madagascar, Mozambique and South Africa. He designed, he designed hatcheries and grow out facilities for eels and was involved at high level of research and aquaculture components. Currently, and for the past 22 years, he has been and is with Aquaculture Innovation South Africa, where he manages the company and affiliated companies Aquaponics Innovations and Aquaculture Solutions. He is involved in the design of fish farms of various types. He provides training for fish farm managers and workers, constructs fish farms in South Africa, Angola, and Zambia and he's busy with similar projects in Nigeria and Uganda. There is a lot more, but let's not take up the valuable time he's giving us to do this presentation today. Thank you, Leslie. It's an absolute pleasure and uh, good afternoon to all the listeners. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, there's a lot of interest in aquaponics and there has been over the last couple of years. And so the purpose of this talk this afternoon from my perspective is to say, what is aquaponics? What is it all about? How does it work? Is there an opportunity? Um, what can be done with aquaponics and so forth? So it's a high level introduction to aquaponics. Um, hopefully this will foster some interest and possibly answer some questions for those of you who don't intend going into aquaponics yourself, but have some, interested, have some interest in the subject. So first of all, let's go back a step and look at the problems. What are the problems with the world that we live in? Uh, specifically from the perspective of why is aquaponics worth talking about? First of all, and probably the largest single problem that we as a planet face is the rapid population growth 
And this is not something that's often spoken about. Um, when last did you hear our president or any other president talk about population growth and the fact that we need to curb population growth? And yet virtually everything, including our current corona crisis, virtually every problem we face has its root in population growth. If you have a look at that website, uh, worldometers.info, it provides some fascinating statistics on the rate at which people are um, being born, sadly people are dying, and as a result the difference between the two is the population growth. And we're currently growing at a rate of about 225,000 people per day. That's births minus deaths. That is clearly not sustainable and on the one hand, and on the other hand, it also represents a very rapidly increasing base of people that need feeding. Um, in addition, we've got decreasing fish supply. Um, and I'll chat about fish because fish is part of what we do in aquaponics. The world supply of fish has reduced significantly um, due to the fact that we have over harvested our wild stocks. So we aren't able to increase the amount of fish obtained from the wild and therefore we're obliged to look at alternative sources of fish. Also food shortage and costs. Uh, land produced food, so vegetable crops, uh, stock and so forth. Um, there, there are general shortages in many parts of the world um, and the cost of purchasing food is increasing as well. There are also questions around the healthiness and the quality associated with feed, feed, uh, uh, sorry, with food. Um, food items that are irrigated with many of the water sources in South Africa, most especially the, the Vaal River system, um, are questionable in terms of the healthiness for them to be eaten. Um, in terms of E. coli and various other uh, more sinister microbes. There's also issues around food produced um, from a hydroponic perspective in that it, it doesn't have the same flavor that food produced in other ways has. Um, then there's also questions around land shortage. Um, the old adage said, buy land, God isn't making any more. Um, and that is very true. There is a limited amount of land that is suitable for agriculture. And as the world population grows, the amount of land available per person then naturally decreases. One of the advantages of aquaponics is that it, it can be done on bedrock, it can be done on shale, it can be done in, on sand. It doesn't require any particular kind of soil, but we'll, we'll come back to that. And then also water shortage. We have to find more efficient ways of producing the food that we need to feed our population. Um, and we need to do that in ways that uses less water. And then also power supply. If you are doing aquaponics, or many other forms of agriculture, you are dependent on an electrical power supply. And as is evident by the fact that some of our delegates are not with us this afternoon, some of the panel are not with us this afternoon, it, it, load shedding is a reality in South Africa and many parts of the continent. And then also the cost of power. If we have a look at the two mother industries, if you like, aquaculture and hydroponics. There are specific problems associated with each of those that can be addressed through aquaponics as well. First of all, if we look at recirculating aquaculture systems, these rely on filtration. So we have the fish at fairly high densities in the tank. We pump new water through the tank continuously. The water coming out of the tanks is then treated to remove the solid wastes. The dissolved organics are converted from toxic forms to non-toxic forms. The water is then heated or cooled to the appropriate temperature and returned to the fish. So those filters are quite an expensive component. In addition, the dissolved organics might be in a fairly benign form, but they can accumulate. Therefore, we have to do water changes. Also, you've got a long way to market your first products. So for instance, with a tilapia farm, you've typically got nine or 10 months from hatchery to first marketing. With a trout farm, that could be 12 or 15 months. Then if we have a look at hydroponics as an industry, 
again, we have expensive nutrient solutions that are required for these plants in a hydroponics situation. Um, it's very artificial and therefore the pest pressure is fairly high. Um, typically what they would do with a hydroponic situation is that they batch farm. So you, let's say you're using a, a greenhouse tunnel as your infrastructure, they would sterilize the environment, plant the crops, grow the crops to market size, harvest the entire tunnel, and then sterilize the tunnel and start again. Um, and you'll see just now the approach of aquaponics is very different to that. Also, the flavors are bland. Um, this is a, a criticism that has been leveled at hydroponics for many years. Um, and if you taste alternative technologies, you, the produce produced from alternative technologies, you can really see that there's a huge difference. So what is aquaponics? Aquaponics is essentially taking these two industries, aquaculture and hydroponics, giving us the aquaponics as a single system where the wastes from the fish, the biological wastes, ammonia and solids, become the nutrient source for the plants, in the sense that bacteria living in the system convert the wastes produced by the fish, the ammonia and the, and the feces, they convert that into nitrates. Nitrates are then taken up by the plants, stripping the nitrogen source out of the water and cleaning the water to come back to the fish. And this cycle can then run uninterrupted for many years. Our first aquaponic system we built in July 2012, it's still running with the same water it originally had in it. There is no accumulation of undesirables in that water. The fish filter in one particular type of aquaponics, and we'll discuss the different types in a moment, but in one of these types, the ebb and flow system, the fish filter is a gravel bed, which is also the media in which the plant is planted. So it becomes a very efficient system as well. If we consider inputs and outputs, the desired outputs from an aquaponic system are plants, or plant crops, and fish. In order to achieve those two, we need to input water, both for the plants and the fish, light, primarily for the plants, depending on the species, it may be for the fish as well, feed for the fish, labor for both, power to power the system, and then certain minerals, trace elements, and so forth, calcium, potassium, iron, and uh, buffer. What are the advantages of aquaponics? Well, first of all, we get faster growth to market size than with field crops. Because the crops are certainly in a temperate environment such as South Africa, the top crops are typically held inside a greenhouse tunnel. And under these conditions, we get very fast growth to market size. Also, the plants are never water stressed. So that also enhances rapid growth. You can also, if you maintain constant conditions throughout the year, you can enjoy constant production throughout the year. So this time of the year, we're picking strawberries still, we're picking cucumbers, peppers, and so forth. You've got fewer diseases than with field crops. The produce is organic. Now let's be clear here. The produce is wholesome, it is natural, it's all those things, but it cannot be certified organic. Part of the organic certification is to, um, the, the philosophy behind it is that we are improving the soils in which our crops are grown. Because you improve the soil, you improve the crop. The reality with aquaponics is we're not farming in soil. We're farming in water and we may be farming in stone. So as a result, the certification of aquaponics for organic uh, production is not possible. However, interestingly enough, they will make an exception in the case of the fish, and you can certify organically produced fish um, should you wish to do so. The crop quality is excellent. One of the strongest marketing points that we've enjoyed over the years is taking a basket of our freshly picked produce to a restaurant, in not only having the entrepreneur there, but also having the um, the chef there and letting them taste the products. 
Now, when you take a leaf of sweet basil and you wrap it around a cherry tomato, both of which having been produced in aquaponics, and you taste that, there is an explosion of flavors in your mouth that you don't experience, or certainly I haven't experienced, with other production forms. So the crop quality is excellent. Also, you've got a small land requirement because we're farming intensively. Along with that, we've got a low labor requirement. Now, a lot of people think coming into aquaponics, they're going to do so to create jobs. Yes, you can create jobs with aquaponics, but be realistic about the number of jobs. A greenhouse tunnel can be run very comfortably by one person. Um, when it comes to picking, you need a few extra hands, but that's for an hour or two in the morning. So aquaponics is not a big employer. The nutrients that are produced by the fish, or shall I say the waste that's produced by the fish, is seen as nutrients rather than seen as a waste that needs to be disposed of, and how do we do so appropriately? So we're using our wastes. Water consumption is vastly lower than with field crop production because we don't have seepage into the soil. We don't have nearly as much evaporation and transpiration. We aren't using expensive hydroponic nutrients. I mentioned a moment ago that there are things we need to add. We need to add a calcium source, potassium, iron, and we need to buffer. We need a source of alkalinity. Beyond that, we don't generally add anything to an aquaponics system. The harvesting of crops is quick and easy because the crops are already in a confined environment, generally at high densities. It's got vastly lot lower operational costs than with field crops. Also, there's no need to wash the crops. I've uh, read articles where they've done scientific experiments on crops that are washed versus crops that are unwashed, and washing the crop significantly reduces the time before decomposition of that crop sets in, given uh, identical handling thereafter. So the advantage of not washing your crops is huge. Swiss chard, for instance, uh, spinach as it's commonly known, is a crop that always has a grittiness to it when it's farmed in traditional ways of farming. However, when, aqua, when Swiss chard is farmed in aquaponics, it doesn't have any of that grittiness. And, and that's just one example. Another advantage of aquaponics is the ability to locate close to the markets. We have a small footprint, so we can put this on a small, possibly expensive piece of land close to the markets, which means that we can service our markets at very short notice. And that is a, a, a huge business advantage as well. Crop management is simpler than with soil farming. You don't have to worry about crop rotation. We've been farming the same variety of cucumbers in our beds since 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, when the old cucumber gets to the point that it's not bearing strongly anymore, we plant the new seedling right next to the base of the old cucumber. And we've been doing that consistently for years. You do not have uh, soil-borne parasites that accumulate in an aquaponics system. It just doesn't happen. Those pest problems that I'm referring to. You also have no weeding because you are farming in an indoor environment inside greenhouse tunnels. There are no weeds. You can also use poor soil areas, such as bedrock, such as inside an old factory or warehouse, um, such as a desert region where there is no organic material in your soils. And also for those of you who are entrepreneurial, aquaponics is a very new industry. And as a new industry, there are lots of opportunities for those of you who want to, take, you, want to make use of those opportunities. Disadvantages of aquaponics include the fact that management must now have a good working knowledge of both the fish and the plant sides of the production. So from my perspective, I come from the fish background. Um, I'm very comfortable with handling the fish. I don't see them as a threat. I can manage them quite easily. But for me, the plants were the challenge. That's the area I needed to learn. For most people, it seems to be the other way around. They come from a uh, plant expertise perspective and need to learn the fish. But either way around, you need to have a good working knowledge of both. Also, your pathogen treatment options are limited because whatever you use on your plants could have an impact not only on the fish, but on the bacteria as well. 
whatever you use for treating the fish, parasites or pathogens, could have an impact on the plants or on the bacteria as well. I mention this not because it's a reality on a day-to-day -day basis, but because it is an important consideration to be aware of. The reality is the, the kind of sprays and pest control methods that we're using in aquaponics, they don't have an impact on the other crops because they are very benign treatments. A third disadvantage associated with aquaponics is that we are completely dependent on electricity. If there's a power failure, you need to have a generator that can run your system during the power failure. And then also, once again, matching what we said under the advantages, but providing the mirror disadvantage, and that is that aquaponics is a relatively new industry. So for those who feel they want all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted, they want to know exactly and precisely and quantitative and empirical, perhaps aquaponics is not the right industry for you just yet. Yes, we can show very clearly there are numerous commercial aquaponics systems around the country that have all started in the last five or six years. Um, there are new ones starting all the time. It isn't a, an industry which has already proven itself. But it is still an industry where there are a lot of uncertainties, planting distances, and micronutrients that could or should be added, et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many areas where we don't yet know exactly how best to do it. The next area that I want to look at is the different types of aquaponics. There are four types of aquaponics primarily. The first of these is nutrient film technique. On the right hand side, you can see that slide. Uh, the blue canvas tank is a fish tank. After the fish tank would be a mechanical filter and a biological filter. Then the water is pumped to the far end where the gentleman is standing against the far end of the tunnel. The water is pumped and it slowly trickles down the inside of each of those pipes, forming a film of water along the bottom of the pipe. Plants are then rooted into the top of the pipe, into these holes and the plant root hangs down inside the pipe, which is mostly air, and touches the water in the bottom part of the pipe. And, where, and that's obviously where it obtains its moisture and its nutrients. There's no rooting material inside that pipe. Um, and there you can see the roots actually hanging inside the pipe, and you can see the shallow film of water, so you're talking half a centimeter or so, along the bottom of the pipe and the roots are drawing their nutrients and moisture from that. We do need a mechanical filter and we do need a biological filter. Therefore, this adds to the cost and it also means that because there's a mechanical filter, you are straining the wastes out of the water and therefore there is a waste stream that is lost from the system when the mechanical filter is cleaned. Once again, there are two major disadvantages from my perspective associated with nutrient film technique. The first of these is the risk of power failure is huge. If you take a greenhouse tunnel on a warm summer's day, you've typically got air temperatures exceeding 30 degrees Celsius. Under these conditions, if your power fails and the generator doesn't come on, you can have the situation, not can, you will have the situation where the water in the pipes will drain out within a matter of a few minutes and your roots are then hanging in air at 30 degrees Celsius. High transpiration at, at those temperatures with the dry air around the roots means that you can very rapidly lose your entire crop if power is not restored. There are ways around this. We put little weirs at the end of the pipe to create a backflow of water. So there's always a shallow form of water in, in the pipe. Um, but still, this remains a disadvantage. The second disadvantage relates to the heating and cooling of the water. During the day, the air temperature can get to 30 degrees plus, And under those conditions, the, this thin film of, of water rapidly takes up temperature. At night, the air inside the tunnel on a cold winter's night can drop down to 10 or 15 degrees Celsius. And under those conditions, the 
temperature of the water rapidly can fall because you've got a thin layer of water in contact with the air. So what you tend to find with nutrient film technique more so than with the other techniques is that your day and night temperature fluctuation tends to be quite a lot greater than with the other types. My personal perspective is I am not a nutrient film technique fan, but having said that, I have colleagues I respect highly who are successfully farming commercially using this technique. Just to provide a plan view or top view schematic on what it looks like, there we have our fish tanks. The water from the fish tanks goes to a mechanical filter. When the mechanical filter is cleaned, some waste is lost from the system. The water then flows to the biological filter where the ammonia produced by the fish, which is toxic to the fish and not really available to the plants, is converted by bacteria to nitrate. The nitrate-rich water then goes to the nutrient film pipes where the plants take the nitrate up and clean the water, which then returns back to the fish. At some point, heating and cooling would need to be introduced as well. There's an example of a beautifully neat and commercially successful nutrient film technique aquaponics system being run in Gerardsville in Pretoria, near, near Centurion. That gentleman is Neil Strach. He's the chairman of the Aquaponics Association in South Africa. The second aquaponics infrastructure type is what we call deep water culture or uh, DWC. Here we have shallow tanks that are about 30 centimeters water depth on which we float polystyrene sheets, typically about 25 millimeter diameter or thickness um, polystyrene sheets. Holes are made in those sheets at the appropriate distances apart according to the crop that you're producing and the crop roots hang through those holes into the water below. So now the plants, unlike nutrient film, in this instance there's no air below the sheets, it is purely water, the plants are hanging completely in water. So the drying out risk that you had just now is not an issue anymore. However, the plants do exhaust the oxygen supply as do the other microbes living in the water. And therefore it's important to replenish that oxygen by having aeration below the rods. Mechanical and biological filtration are both still required. And this is the least expensive infrastructure type for aquaponics and is therefore the one that is most commonly used on a commercial scale, provided that you're producing leafy greens, such as lettuce and basil and other herbs and so forth. In this instance, the fish tanks drain into mechanical filter and biological filter exactly as with nutrient film technique. Thereafter, the water goes, the nutrient rich water goes to these large um, raft tanks on which the rafts float and in the rafts the plants grow. The plants strip the nutrients out of the water and the water comes back to the fish cleaned once again. And there's an example of um, on the left hand side is when we started our raft tunnel in Grahamstown um, and on the right hand side you can see a few weeks later, that's about four weeks later when those crops are growing well. Uh, this facility, it's got three lines of rafts like this and has a capacity of 8,000 heads of lettuce per month. We mentioned two disadvantages of nutrient film technique. I've already mentioned the drying out of the roots is not a risk in case of power failure because the plants are rooted in water permanently. The second risk was the heating and cooling or disadvantage was the heating and cooling of the thin film of water in the nutrient film pipes. That is also not an issue here. And with nutrient film technique, sorry, with uh, deep water culture, this raft technique, you tend to have very stable water temperatures. The third technique that I would like to look at is that of ebb and flow. Uh, this is a gravel bed based system. So we have uh, very strong beds typically made of fiberglass, in some instances made of wood, that, are, that allow for about 30 centimeters of depth of stone. Within the stone, and that stone is about 20, 20 to 30 mils in diameter, 
Within the stone, we have a flood and drain cycle. So generally what happens is the pump pumps water into the bed continuously. And within the bed, there is a siphon mechanism that starts and stops automatically. So when the bed fills up to high tide, the siphon starts and rapidly drains all the water out of the bed. And then the siphon breaks at low tide, allowing the water to again fill up. And that cycle is typically about 10 or 15 minutes in duration. The media, the stone inside these beds, then becomes the mechanical filter to strain out the solids and the biological filter to house the bacteria that convert the ammonia to nitrate. And ebb and flow aquaponics is the most variable in terms of the crops you can grow. You can grow virtually anything in these systems. I've seen cactus grown here, I've seen trees grown here, I've seen herbs, cut flowers, all sorts of things grow. And the, this is a medium cost to establish. It's not as expensive as a nutrient film, but it's generally more expensive than a raft type system. A nursery is not required in the sense, in this instance, because you can seed directly into the stone beds. We plant our larger seeds, such as the pumpkin, watermelon, gem type seeds. We plant those as well as cucumbers directly into the bed where we want the plant to grow. You can also obviously grow seedlings and, and plant the seedlings in here. And the advantage of seedlings is that you then have more accurate spacing. You've also grown the plant a month or so older prior to putting it in the bed. So you're not wasting bed growth time. Um, but however, many crops, especially the smaller herbs like rocket and so forth, we generally just sprinkle the rocket seeds across the top of the beds. And three weeks later, we come and we inspect to see where there was low germination and we sprinkled some more seeds in that area. So it's a very rudimentary but effective way of growing seeds directly into the beds. The schematic in this case is simply the fish tanks. From the fish tanks, the water gets pumped to the grow beds. Each grow bed floods and drains independently and then drains back to the fish tanks independently. So these grow beds are all in parallel. None of them are in series. A possible improvement to this, as a result of the fact that fish feces do eventually block the grow beds. And typically we need to clean our grow beds in an ebb and flow system about once a year. To reduce the frequency of that, you can add a mechanical filter even a very rudimentary mechanical filter between the fish tanks and the grow beds, and that effectively reduces the cleaning interval or increases the cleaning interval of the grow beds. And there's an example of, this is one of our tunnels in Gramstown, and you can see the lush growth of plants in that system. The fourth type that I want to mention is a decoupled aquaponic system. Now, what we've looked at thus far, different aquaponic systems where we have the plants and the fish in a single infrastructure, in a single housing. Let's call it a greenhouse tunnel. It could just as easily be inside a factory. It could even be outdoors. A different way of looking at this is relevant when you become commercial. On a commercial scale, there, there is adequate scale to house the fish and the plants separately, thereby enabling you to, let's say, have trout as the fish because it's a good market and a high price for trout. The trout need to be kept at about 15 degrees Celsius. So we keep the trout under their optimal conditions. The water coming out of the trout system goes to a... Um, an aquaponics tunnel, it could even go to two different aquaponics tunnels. The one could be with cucumbers at 26 degrees Celsius. The other could be with lettuce at 22 degrees Celsius. So by having these installations on a much larger scale and by decoupling them, it enables us to hold different components under optimal conditions. So the plants and the fish are then farmed separately. The fish filter wastes that are generated when we clean that filter are drained into a mineralization tank. Now mineralization takes place where we have an aerobic environment, especially it also takes place anaerobically, but we prefer to keep it aerobic. Um, and 
at least three days of generous aeration inside the mineralization tank allows the bacteria and other microbes to convert the wastes in the fish right down to their mineralized state. This is a very basic elemental state before they go to the plants, which facilitates their rapid uptake by the plants. And the clean water then returns to the fish. This is an example of a decoupled system. Now, you'll see I've put a blue spotted line on the left-hand side and a green spotted line on the right-hand side. Let's have a look at these. There are four components. The first component is the clean water. The water from the borehole or from our farm dam or river goes into the clean water supply. That supplies water to the fish system. So the fish system has tanks, mechanical filter, biological filter, and the water circulates com continuously. When we lose water from the system by cleaning the mechanical filter, that is replaced by an equivalent volume of water from the clean water system. The third component then is the mineralization tank. This is where the waste from the filter, which is rich in organic fertilizers, goes into the mineralization tank and is aerated vigorously there for three days. Then the final component is the um, aquaponics component. And you can use any one of those three techniques here. I've demonstrated rafts, but it could be any one of the three. Here what we have is we have two sumps below the level of the rafts. A pump in the first sump pumps the water through the rafts, it travels across by gravity and back into the second sump by gravity. And so you have this continuous loop in this direction. Simultaneously, you have a small pump in the, in the second sump, the, sump the, the top sump, the one I'm indicating with the arrow here. That second pump is on a timer and it's smaller than the first pump. The second pump switches on at pre-selective intervals, typically three or four times a day for half an hour or so. It slowly pumps water out of this system back to the clean water tax. Now, this can be clean water because it's the water that comes from the plants, which has effectively been stripped of its nutrients. Because this pump is larger than that pump, it continues circulating the water. But as the slow flow of water is pumped from here to there, it is replaced by water running into this sump from the mineralization tank. Because this pump is stronger than that one, this water pumps out of here, taking all this nutrient rich water to the plants. So in this way, we kept our fish under ideal conditions and our plants under different ideal conditions and this works really well for a commercial aquaponics system crop options for aquaponics your fish waste is very high in nitrogen compounds most especially ammonia which becomes nitrate and this is rocket fuel for the growth of leafy crops such as lettuce and a whole bunch of different herbs uh, basil, celery, mint, watercress, uh, spinach, and so forth. We also can produce many fruiting crops in aquaponics. In our system, we do cherry tomatoes, we do cucumbers, we do peppers, brinjals, uh, um, zucchinis, and so forth. We're also doing, at this time of the year, we do uh, broccoli and, and cauliflower as well. And in terms of essential oils, when you go into an aquaponics tunnel in wintertime and it's been closed up at night and you walk in first thing in the morning and they're growing crops such as basil, which is aromatic, you'll pick up an overwhelming smell of basil in there. And because of this, we spoke to an essential oils company a couple of years ago and ran trials for them on growing essential oil crops in aquaponics. Our logic being that if these smells are enhanced, surely the oil content and quality should be enhanced as well. Um, we, at the end of the trial, we uh, delivered the plants to them. They pressed the plants and were absolutely delighted in terms of the quality and quantity of oil that they obtained from the rose geranium, which was the crop that we selected for the trial, or they selected for the trial. Unfortunately, though, although the quality and quantity relative to the amount of plants we gave back were very good from their perspective, from a commercial perspective, 
the numbers just didn't make sense. You produce so little oil that unless it's a byproduct from a plant that you can harvest in some other way as well, it, it, I couldn't make the numbers stack. The other option is ornamental. Uh, cut flowers and so forth can also be grown in an aquaponics situation. And close to my heart at the moment, having fired numerous staff over the last while for stealing from us, is the fact that cut flowers don't represent a theft uh, appeal to people who are hungry. So there is that advantage as well. You can also grow duckweed in an aquaponics environment. So typically you'd use a raft type setting. Instead of having polystyrene sheets with lettuce, you just pl place duckweed on there and the duckweed is harvested to be fed to the fish. Technically, yes, it works. The fish love it, they grow on it as a supplement to their artificial feed diet. But once again, economically, it doesn't make sense. There is an example. This is our greenhouse tunnel in Grahamstown shortly after we erected it in 2012. You'll notice these here are grow beds. That is the, these are the ebb and flow beds that are full of stone. These here are being run as deep water culture or raft beds where you've got the polystyrene sheets and the plants are growing in the polystyrene sheets. These have all been turned into gravel beds or ebb and flow beds as well. So we've got a total of 40 gravel beds in that tunnel with a capacity of about 50 kgs of herbs, 60 kgs of tilapia and 1,500 cucumbers from that tunnel per month. In terms of aquaponics, are there any questions? There are actually quite a number of questions, um, so I'll try and go through them uh, a little bit. Some of them I think you've already answered. Um, okay. Hartleru, for instance, asked uh, about uh, any commercial successful aquaponics production companies in South Africa. Um, yes, there are numerous. And then he asked, what is the current fish production output per year? Um, I, I'll give you a general answer, which is perhaps, perhaps more useful than a specific answer. And I don't have the specifics for different companies. Um, but Gert, the area of an aquaponics system, typically about 20% of the area is allocated to fish and about 80% is allocated to plants. When you look at income, it tends to be even higher in the favor of the plants. About 90% of your income typically comes from plants and only about 10% from the fish. But bear in mind, this depends enormously on which crops you're growing. If you're growing lettuce, it's going to be a very different to if you're growing cabbages, for instance. Now that uh, he actually carried on with his questions, we said the economy, he needed to know the economy of scale for fish production component. Uh, of a financially feasible aquaponic system. So if, 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 if we're actually talking about the plants here, then yeah, I mean, uh, he's looking more at the fish, isn't he? Yes, okay. So there, there, there are, what I can do is give you a little bit of history. 10 years ago, aquaponics was regarded as, as sort of hillbilly. Um, serious business people didn't look at aquaponics. It was very much the, the realm of the, the nutty left. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen a complete swing where 10 years ago, people were disposing of their waste from their fish farms. Um, now they're seeing that as a nutrient source and they are retrofitting aquaponics onto their aquaculture facilities to utilize that waste and convert it into plants which can be sold at an attractive margin. So that is one justification for aquaponics is to retrofit onto the aquaculture, an existing aquaculture facility, in which case you'd have the numbers for the fish. And in terms of area, you can work out on roughly five times the area is the amount of crops that you would have for the, sorry, four times, is the roughly the number of crops you'd have relative to the fish. Let me go back to the example that I gave in terms of our farm in Grahamstown. That facility, it's a 30 by 10 greenhouse tunnel, uh, can produce a 1,500 cucumbers and about 50 kilos of herbs and mixed veggies per month, plus about 60 kilos of tilapia. So that would give you also a ratio to work with. The ratio is very similar if you're using other fish species. Um, for a decoupled system, of course, you would have 
very different scale, but the, the ratios would remain similar. He also asked what fish species are suitable for production in aquaponics? Good question. Um, tilapia is generally used because tilapia are bulletproof. They are freely available. They, yeah, they, they're really an easy fish to work with. And they do work, technically they work very well in an aquaponics system. Um, my preference would be catfish, uh, sorry, would be trout though. The reason being that trout are technically a little bit more tricky to manage. You need to keep the water below 22 degrees Celsius. You need to ensure there's enough oxygen throughout the year and so forth. But the demand for trout is excellent and the price for trout is, is almost double the price for tilapia. So your, your, your profit margin potential is much greater with trout. Catfish can also be used, but don't stock them at massively high densities because otherwise you overwhelm the filtration system. And it's obviously it's designed for that. You can also use ornamental fish, uh, koi and goldfish and so forth. Um, but traditionally, goldfish and koi are held at low densities, which doesn't really suit commercial crop production. So if it's a hobbyist system, goldfish and koi work very well, especially where people don't want to ever slaughter the fish. Uh, they just want it for entertainment, for pleasure, and to grow tasty, good-looking crops. Then ornamental fish can also work. He also wanted to know whether there's any um, uh, information available about the total fish production output in 2019, for instance, from aquaponic production systems in South Africa by species. Do you know? Um, there is an aquaponics association, Kat. Um, aquaponicssa.org, I believe, is the website address. Aquaponicssa.org. Uh, if you're not sure, send me an email and I will, I will put you in contact with the chair, Neil Strach. Um, they would probably be able to supply you with that sort of information. Thanks. Then there's a question from Tamsin Davids. She wanted to know uh, how do you just dispose of the waste in a proper manner? Uh, I, she's talking about the wastewater, but I mean, that's exactly what we've been talking about. I would imagine she's talking about the waste that you filter out. Okay, uh, let, me, let me answer that from two different perspectives. The first is that the, the very reason, the very justification, the very um, reason why we use aquaponics is to take the waste from the fish water and turn it into vegetables and clean water, and the clean water goes back to the fish. There is no waste to speak of. However, there always is some waste. From time to time, the grow beds block Typically about once every year, the grow beds need to be cleaned. What you clean out of the grow beds is very is thick, rich, organic material. Um, also, if you're farming with nutrient film technique or deep water culture, in either instance, you have a mechanical filter and therefore when you clean the mechanical filter, there is some waste. In both situations, that waste typically goes into a mineralization tank, is mineralized and then reused back in the system. The mineralization tank itself will theoretically need to be cleaned at some point because there is some material that will accumulate in there. But we, we haven't yet been running aquaponics systems for long enough to know how long it takes. Our mineralization tank, I climb into it periodically, once a year or so, and just check what's happening in the floor on the floor of the tank and we haven't yet needed to clean it. So after a couple of years, it's still running beautifully. So the reality is, is there's very, very little real waste, if any, that comes out of the total aquaponics environment. Fat also asked uh, um, how does fish production, the costs in fish production in aquaponics systems compared to production in example, uh, open water cage production systems. Was that You're difficult? comparing a Bucky to a Mercedes Benz. They've got completely <laughs> different functions. Open water cage culture is, is uh, debatably the least expensive way of farming fish. I say debatably because earth ponds could be. Earth ponds probably are the least expensive way of producing fish. Uh, cage culture is, is very close behind that. But that assumes a couple of things. Firstly, 
you're probably talking about tilapia or trout. Um, and secondly, we're in a temperate climate. So there is nowhere in South Africa, not Messina, not Jazini, that is warm enough for cage culture of tilapia commercially. So forget it, you, you can't do it in South Africa. Trout can be done in certain parts of the country, but just be careful with summer temperatures and thermoclines and so forth. So yes, you can produce trout in South Africa. You can't really produce tilapia in South Africa in cage culture. It's not a suitable environment. So you're obliged in a temperate country, temperate climate like South Africa to use recirculating systems and then tagging aquaponics onto that makes economic sense. Perhaps just to finish that thought, um, if we were in Uganda, we'd be having a different discussion because in Uganda, it makes sense to farm your fish in earth ponds or um, cages, not so much in recirculating systems, unless you're doing catfish. So the other species would typically be done outdoors, in which case you wouldn't be able to, har to harness or access the water that contains the rich nutrients to grow your plants because it's distributed within the environment. Um, then he also asked, what's the optimal stocking density for fish in these systems? That depends on the design. In a traditional decoupled aquaponic system, you're farming the fish under normal fish circumstances. So you'd have the fish under traditional densities, which is typically aiming for a, a harvest density of somewhere between 30 and 40 kilos per cube for trout or tilapia by the time you harvest the fish at market size. If you're close to the coast, you might even get that up to as high as 50 kilos per cube. If you're doing catfish, typically the catfish are stocked at around 200 or even more than 200 kilos per cube. But then just bear in mind what I said just now, you need to then have a vastly larger amount of plants relative to the catfish because you've got so much more catfish waste being produced. Nigel suddenly asked where the seedlings come from uh, that you plant, or do you use seeds as well? Or you were telling that you were using seeds in some instances. Yeah, we grow our own seedlings. Um, if you are fortunate, such as many of my colleagues are, to be based in Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, and so forth, where they have seedling suppliers close by, and you trust that those seedlings are truly uh, sterile in terms of any kind of diseases that could come into your system, then yes, you can you can obtain seedlings and, and many people do. We don't, in Grahamstown, we don't have a seedling supply nearby. So we actually purchase the seeds um, and grow them out ourselves in seed trays to the correct size and then we put them in the aquaponic system. In fact, I've, I've got a YouTube channel that if you send me an email, I'll put you in touch with the YouTube channel or look under aquaculture innovations on YouTube and you'll come across a whole bunch of videos where we actually one of the things we show is, is how we do the, the seedlings for our aquaponic systems. Uh, Gert was actually trying to also say that the problem with higher fish production costs in, uh, in RAS or aquaponic systems is that you are competing in the market with fish grown more economically elsewhere or import it? Uh, that is right. We, we are competing, for instance, with tilapia. It's cheaper to farm tilapia in Zimbabwe in cages in Lake Kariba and import them into South Africa than it is to farm tilapia in South Africa. That is a reality. And the same is true for cage culture in China. Uh, add to that glazing and government subsidies and various other things. You, you are right. It's cheaper to import tilapia than it is to produce it. Trout, it's not true though. It's, it's cheaper to, to produce trout in South Africa, the quality trout that we, that we can sell here, um, rather than importing it. So it does depend on your species. Catfish as well. It's cheaper to produce catfish in South Africa than it is to import it. But I, I no. also come back and stress that aquaponics is not primarily about the fish. Uh, aquaponics is actually more about the crops. The fish are the fuel that, that um, generate the growth of the crops. The fish are not your primary income, neither are they your primary sort of technical focus. So Melvin Drudley uh, asked, 
what sort of capex budget is ballpark if you want to start up something like an aquaponic system? Obviously, it depends on the size. <laughs> Yeah, it depends on the size. I'll give you an example. We've got a what we call a circle of plenty. It's a two fish tank, one filter tank, one sump, 12 grow bed type system. Um, it occupies a space of 12 by 12 meters. And we can install that in South Africa, any, pretty much anywhere in South Africa for 172,000 plus VAT. So I'd call it 200,000 Rand for a round number for a system of 144 square meters. That doesn't include a generator, it doesn't include a greenhouse, both of which would be highly advantageous. If you're putting up a greenhouse, you can then put in a lot more grow beds and fish tanks, and a greenhouse system installed in South Africa with a backup generator is about 900,000 Rand plus that. Okay. Um, then uh, Zainab Nordian asked, are there any regulations in South Africa that govern testing requirements for aquaponics crops? Do you know? What testing would that be? Are you talking about uh, microbiological testing on the crop for human consumption? If so, it depends on the market you're supplying. Um, yeah, if, if we supply to pick and pay and so forth, um, we don't have issues there, but we can't, we're, sorry, we supply cucumbers and salad greens to pick and pay, no problem. But we can't supply our fish to pick and pay because we aren't, we don't have the NRCS certification that is required to supply fish into a supermarket. However, we can supply the fish into delis. Okay. Um... So Zainab Nordin asked if 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 she if one is wanting to have an aquaponic system for private or home use, uh, is that uh, possible? You mentioned koi or goldfish are suitable, but then is that is that does that make sense for home use? Absolutely, yes. it it certainly does. You you can put in a very small aquaponic system, a single grow bed, and a and a fish tank. The each of those could be the bottom half of a JoJo tank, for instance, the bottom portion of a JoJo tank, which has been converted. You can do so for under 10,000 Rand and you can grow the most amazing crops. You can have lots of fun. Um, you can certainly do that. Yes. If, if you have a look on Pinterest or um, other websites, YouTube and so forth on the Internet, you'll find many dozens of different design options and ideas for home aquaponic systems. Oh, wow, that's very, very interesting. Um, then uh, Sia Bonga uh, Kanye asks about uh, the fish tank. Does it have, can it be outside the greenhouse if he has constraints in the greenhouse? Um, I would imagine that doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, to some degree, yes, it can. Um, but bear in mind that it partially defeats the purpose of having a greenhouse if part of your infrastructure is outside the greenhouse because the purpose of the greenhouse from the fisher's perspective is to insulate from heat loss at night in, on cold winter nights. From the plant's perspective, however, the greenhouse serves additional benefits, not just insulating against heat loss and the passive generation of heat during the day, but also it, it reduces the amount of wind, dust, and rain that reduces the crop quality. So in the second instance where you're trying to maintain crop quality, um, and if your environment is not too cold for the fish to be outside, then yes, you can do that. Our circle of plenty, for instance, is typically installed in a completely outside environment. Okay, Trevor Taylor um, asked, uh, what sort of payback period can one expect on the 900k investment? Trevor, I've given you the figures on the 1,500 cucumbers, 50 kgs of herbs and 60 kgs of tilapia per month. And have a look at your local market prices and you can work it back from there. I'm, I'm deliberately not telling you what those market prices are because they vary a lot in different parts of the country. <laughs> And then Trevor also asked whether any of the leafy greens are supplied to uh, places like Nando's or KFC. 
We don't ourselves, um, but it's quite possible that some of the other producers do supply into those markets, yes. I know that the Aquaponics Association has been very in active with the with cancer, with the Heart Foundation and so forth, and has succeeded in getting certification from both organizations that our crops meet and exceed their standards. So there, there, there are many opportunities for supplying into that sort of market. Well, I think we've come to the end of our questions and it's uh, nearly an hour since we started. So I don't know whether uh, we have uh, our thank, uh, our person who was going to thank you here online. Uh, Owen hasn't managed to come on. Okay, so I will uh, thank you uh, on behalf of the Northern Branch and particularly of, uh, uh, on behalf of Owen Frisbee who has tried for years, like you know, to get you to do a presentation to us uh, at the Northern Branch in person actually. But um, this is even better in a way because uh, now we've reached so many more people and I think that maybe more people will even uh, watch the video afterwards um, as we will put it up on our website. So I want to thank you very, very much. Um, usually we give someone a bottle of uh, wine, <laughs> so we'll have to do that another time, but at least the bottle stores are open again. Um, just to say thank you for, for your efforts and, and, and for informing you uh, on this topic, which uh, is really very, very interesting and um, yeah, can probably be used in a lot of ways in the future, in our country and, and in Africa anyway. So thank you very much for your time, we appreciate it. That's an absolute pleasure and all the best to, to you and your organization and your listeners. Thanks, have a good day. Thank you.